The Bull Simons Award, named after the legendary Colonel Arthur Bull Simons, is presented annually by the Commander of U.S. Special Operations Command as a Lifetime Achievement Award to those who embody the true spirit, values, and skills of the Special Operations Warrior. Tonight, we honor a man whose 35-year career spanned the full spectrum of special operations and who held leadership positions at all major command levels, culminating as Commander of United States Special Operations Command and Chief of Staff of the Army, General Peter J. Schoomaker. It was uh, mid to late 60s, the draft was in, and uh, everybody was, uh, was doing something, or most everybody was. <laughs> I, I basically entered the Army through ROTC. Went to do my first duty assignment at uh, Fort uh, Campbell, Kentucky, where I was a recon platoon leader in an infantry battalion. We eventually ended up going to Germany as a battalion. I actually ended up uh, going um, into special operations, making a decision that I was going to leave the Army as a captain. I was working for Colonel Bud Sidnor at the time, who was uh, Bull Simon's uh, deputy on the Sante Raid. He didn't agree with me leaving the Army and sent me to Fort Bragg. He wouldn't tell me what it was for or anything, but he just said, go down to Fort Bragg and report to this, this person and uh, make your mind up after you get through with that. Well, the first time I met uh, Peter Schumacher, we were forming a new unit at Fort Bragg uh, in the late 70s. He was one of the first officer intakes. Uh, went through selection and assessment, and basically that started his uh, special operations career. You have to remember that we, we started from scratch. And the one thing about Colonel Beckwith was that he wanted, quote unquote, the right cut of cloth. Well, I first met young Captain Schoomaker uh, in early 1978 when he showed up at Fort Bragg to attend the Special Mission Unit Assessment and Selection Course. So there was this young cavalry captain trying out for the premier unit in the Army. So there was a little bit of joking about what was going to happen here and it was quickly turned around and everyone was seriously impressed with this young captain and his strategic vision and the way that he went about everything that he approached doing. In November 1979, the Iranian hostage event went down and from that day, the full focus of the entire organization was on the Eagle Claw operation into Desert One. In those days, there were no long-range helicopters that could fly from a carrier all the way into Tehran with a load of troops on board, conduct a mission, and then recover. Uh, as a result, for a number of reasons, we had to establish a refuel site that became known as Desert One in the middle of Dashti Kavir so that we could bring the helicopters and fixed-wing aircraft with fuel on them into this location, refuel the aircraft, load the troops, and then carry on to eventually get the hostages out. And we, we uh, went through uh, all kinds of activities there, waiting on the helicopters to arrive. And then we were informed that uh, the last critical helicopter was not operational. I can remember one uh, word in all caps on the operation schedule, and it said, if less than six helicopters leave Desert One, and the one word in all caps was abort. Um, and so while they were refueling, one of them had, uh, you know, got misoriented and ended up with the accident with the 130. There was just utter confusion everywhere. And, you know, we're providing first aid, and we started taking them aboard. The other air aircraft also started taking people aboard. We ended up limping out very slowly, ended up being the last aircraft out of Iranian airspace. Fuel leaking all over the place, injured people, and all the rest of it. It was a very long ride. Two of our American aircraft collided on the ground in a remote desert location in Iran. Pete was one of the captains from Desert One era that said never again. And he set about, along with a, a number of others, to make sure that that the country never experienced the, the searing sadness of Desert One again. When I was in college football, we're the only undefeated Division One school in the nation at the time that we, we lost the Sugar Bowl. And it was a huge disappointment. And I've talked to a lot of young people and I try to put it in perspective. I said, I really never understood that football was just a game until Desert One in terms of failures like that. 
And that's part of his leadership ethos. Every man that serves under him knows that he is going to be the best commander he can be, and he's going to look out for him. You know, you have to have you have to be successful. But you want to bring everybody home to play with mama and the kids. Pete had some basic rules of engagement, the coyote rules or the five major characteristics of special operations forces and so on. He had a way of crystallizing uh, important themes. He knows who he is and what he believes. He was perfectly willing to speak his mind. He, he's not someone who uh, is shy. And if he doesn't agree with you, he looks you in the eye and tells you. His vision of stuff was really core to setting the stage so that when the first units did deploy to, you know, into Afghanistan and the war on terror began on earnest, his vision was realized. Desert One was part of the education of Peter J. Schumacher. He always paid attention to what could be learned from any situation, whether successful or not. And uh, I think it's one of the things that really helped him develop into the superb general officer that he eventually became. That, that event, in my view, probably is one of the most successful failures in, in history because it really led directly to the creation of the current special operation forces that we have today and eventually the creation of U.S. Open. He was a leader that did everything he asked anyone else to do. And he was always that solid rock that you could count on. And when he listened to you, you knew he was listening. One of the principles that Pete carried with him for the rest of his career was the fact that if you want a really good plan, you have to push the planning to the level of the men who are going to live and die as a result of that plan. He knows you never chase success. You always achieve excellence. You can make yourself excellent. You cannot make yourself successful. That is up to somebody else. Pete Schumacher exemplifies that more than anybody I have ever met. You know, I never thought I was going to be a general. I never thought I was going to stay in the Army. I never thought, you know, I, you know, to be honest with you, I never did have a plan, you know. I just did things that I thought were good and enjoyed them. I mean, I've worked like a man since I was 12 or 13 years old. No, I just never, never thought about anything being too hard to do. Ladies and gentlemen, please join us in welcoming General Peter J. Schoomaker.